guys, this is Andrew with HKN, <coughs> and today we're going to be talking about orthonormal basis functions and the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process. Um, this is going to be a quick video, hopefully, um, and this is part two of our background knowledge on optimal receivers. So first of all, um, we talked about orthonormal basis functions back in our video on discrete, uh, discrete signals, and we said that we want to find a basis set to represent signals, um, and it wasn't always obvious how to make a basis set. Well, first of all, um, sometimes the basis can be obvious. For example, if we look here, we have two signals. One that goes from 0 to t and has height 1, and one goes from t to 2t and has height 1. And if we recall, recall what orthonormal means, so orthonormal, it means that the integral of phi 1 of, or phi k, for instance, of t uh, times phi j of t conjugate dt um, over all t has to equal to 1 when k is equal to j and 0 otherwise. So we represent that with a Kronecker delta function. Uh, and what we see here is that if we multiply, if we take the dot product of these two signals, um, you get a number when the numbers are this, when you take the signal with itself, but if you take the signal with the other signal, if you dot product this signal 1 with this signal 2, uh, you actually get 0. So in case of the fact that these are already normal to each other, meaning that their dot product is 0, we can just normalize these signals and use them as our basis functions. So our phi 1 here will, go, will still be a straight line from 0 to t, but it won't be height 1, because if you take the integral of this magnitude squared, um, what you'll get is uh, you get t squared. That's uh, Actually, you get t. That's not what you want. Uh, you want the integral over this squared um, to be 1. So we actually have to use... 1 over t square rooted so that when we square this function we get 1 over t and then this is a box so the area of a box is 1 over t times t so so will the integral be 1 over t times t which is 1 which is what we wanted. Uh, you can do the same thing over here and have this also be height 1 over t square rooted and then we have our basis set here. We can express these signals in terms of these signals. And nicely enough, we can express these as vectors now. So it's square root of t and no contribution from the second signal, uh, from the second basis set for the first signal. And the second signal has no contribution from the first basis. And root t times this. So now if I take these vectors and multiply them by phi 1 of t phi 2 of t, like this, we actually get back these original signals because we get square root of t times this, which gives us back our original signal, and we get square root of t times this, which gets us back our original signal, S2 which is exactly what we wanted to represent. So in some way, we can think of these signals as just being these two numbers represented because we represented both with respect to a signal ba single basis. Um, so that was an obvious example where you look at them and you're like, okay, this is kind of intuitive. Um, but in some cases, they would not be. And in most cases, they'll, they won't be um, unless they're picked to be very nice. Um, so... For those cases, we have what's called the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process, which I'm going to abbreviate as GSO. And what this basically is, is it's an algorithm for making an orthogonal basis. So the initialization process, uh, I'll write it in algorithmic form. The initialization process is to take the first signal, the first uh, basis set, and set it equal to the normalized first signal. 
So we take S1 of t and divide it by the integral over all time of the magnitude of S1 of t squared. Uh, so basically, we take the signal and divide it by the energy so that the resulting phi has unit energy, which is what we wanted. Um, and we call that our first basis. Um, this negative infinity to infinity is just all encompassing. Generally, for these signals, for instance, it would be 0 to t you could restrict it to. Um, and it would just be an easier to in integral to take. Um, and you actually want to divide it by the square root of this. You want to divide it by the square root of all that. Um, then, for the second process, you go to, you, you set, say, g2 of t, and you take the subtraction of S2 of t minus the projection of S2 onto, onto the first basis of t. So basically, you take the amount of S2 in the direction of phi 1 and subtract it off. So that's kind of like how we make basis sets in, of vectors. So if, say I have a vector here and a vector here call it vector 1 and vector 2, I would take the dot product of these two and get the amount of this vector one, of vector 2 in vector 1's direction, say it would be about that much, and what would left over would be something like this. And so what we're doing here is we're saying that we would call our first basis the phi 1. We would call it v1 over the magnitude of v1. And then we would say phi 2 would equal to vector 2 minus vector 2 projected onto vector 1 divided by this magnitude. So over here, we call this thing G2. We subtract off the projection onto the previous basis. And then we take, we call phi 2, the second basis vector, the same as up here, but instead of with the original signal, we do it with the signal with all previous components subtracted off. So it's this, the integral of the magnitude of G2 of t squared dt. So that would be step three. I'll go through step four and five, but then after this it'll just kind of be a and so on situation. So we're going to call g3 of t uh, equal to the third signal minus the projection of the third signal onto the second basis function minus the projection of the third signal onto the first basis function. And then we're going to say that g3 of t divided by the square root of the integral from negative infinity to infinity of the magnitude squared of g of t of g3 of t dt is equal to phi 3 of t. And so on and so forth. You just keep going until when you calculate g sub n of t and that equals 0, then you terminate the process. Then you're done. Uh, because you've specifically, uh, when you've exhausted all of your signals, so you take all of your signals and you're done and you can't physically do this. So either when you run out of signals or when you start you start getting zeros when you start calculating GNs, that's when you finish the gram spin orthogonalization process. And that's just basically a way to find an orthonormal basis to find these phi's for, by which you can project uh, S onto them. So in order to get what these S vectors are, you have to do a projection of the signal S onto each one of these bases and then just take those numbers and those become the coordinates. Um, 
Uh, the grand square orthogonalization process is the way to find a basis set for any set of signals. This will work for no matter what set you use. Um, and that's just some background information on what orthonormal bases are and what the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process is. Hope you guys learned something and have a nice day.